illicit drugs, yep. crime prevention and sentencing, yep. criminal justice, yep. victimology, yep. delinquency, crime, yep. criminology, corrections. Yep. How many years did you do for all that? Welcome to another episode from the Messenden Rangers and District Motor Club. I'm with John Van Grottingen. John has got a fantastic story to tell about the car club and um, some of the roles that he's had within the car club. And believe me, John's got a, a story and a half to tell about many different things. And um, But we'll start with the car club, John. All right. Now, how long have you been in the car club for? Uh, I must have joined in the late, in the mid 80s. I can remember vividly going along to a meeting shortly after I got but the Wolseley. I went along to a meeting. At that point, the meetings were being held in the Senior Citizens Center in Wood End temporarily. So how many people were there? Uh, there were probably about 30 people there at the time. And at the end of that meeting, uh, it was annual general meeting and they were electing officers and they could not get a secretary and nobody would volunteer to work as a secretary. Uh -huh. And the guy that was a president at the time said, look, by law, we have to have a president and we have to have a treasurer and a secretary. And if you don't have that, the club has to fold up. Uh, Jeannie, you, you're not the waitress. <laughs> <laughs> you're John's better half. <laughs> uh, so uh, it was said, and he was serious. Ian was serious. He said, yep. Goldsworthy, he was a president. And he said, look, we cannot go on without a secretary. By law, we have to have one, the very incorporated body. Yes. So anyway, he said, the club will wind up. So everybody sat there silent for a while, and I said, all right, all right. I'll, so you became the secretary. I became the secretary <laughs> under, under duress. So at <laughs> your really. first meeting. At my first meeting. Uh, so I became the secretary. Uh, the secretary immediately ended up having another role. That was Picnic at Hanging Rock. That, really? Now, after that, of course, later on, we, got, we have an, a, a hang out, Hanging Rock director. Yes. Organizer. Absolutely. Yeah, I did it for 10 years. Did you? I did it for 10 years. So and that's my, from the mid-80s. Yes. Know? And my planning time at the time I did it, uh, thankfully, I had a very good secretary at work who used to do a bit of book work for me. But my planning used to be that you have 18 months in advance. So you're working on one, plus you're starting on the next one, even though it's 18 months away. Yes. The big issue was getting organizers, getting sponsors, uh, getting the facilities. Yes. And not only that, back in those days, we also had, and we, I don't know when we stopped it, but we used to always have what we call, uh, a lot of sponsors gave us gifts and bits and pieces, and we had a, a bag fill situation. Uh -huh. One week before yeah. the Hanging Rock, yes. we would sit down, a whole group of people, and fill all these bags. And we would fill a couple thousand bags Wow. with all sorts of samples. And as the people came through the gate, they were- Got a bag. Got a bag. They got a bag, and the bag would have a whole lot of stuff in it. Yes. And I still have some of the bits and pieces in the back that used to be there. <laughs> we had samples of hand wash, and we had samples of this and samples of that. <laughs> yes. I mean, some of them you know, weren't just gift. Sure, a lot of them were literature uh, about uh, vouchers and things, but some of them were real things. Yes. Everything from balloons to ballpoint pens to hand wash, whatever it could be. So they were all put in. But that, Jane? Yeah, RACV used to give us, different people gave us bits. Yes. And we used to then sit down, and, and that used to be an incredible day on a Saturday where uh, you would walk along and pick up all these things and put them in the bag. Yes. And people kept going around and around these tables and filling the bags. Yes. And then the bags. Thank you. Yeah, then the yes. bags would all be piled up. Can you reach? Yeah, oh, yeah. Hang on, yep, yeah, no, yeah, I'll look closer. Yeah, 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 that's cool. The yeah. bags would all be filled and then carted off so, to Hanging Rock on the morning of of the event of the event and then they yeah. would be in a big back of a trailer or a truck at the gate yes. and as people came in they all got a bag got it yeah 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 now you did that for 10 years i did i did the organize actually did the organization i think for 12 years that okay. i did it and wh what happened after that well that uh, to that point it became to the point where they said why don't we get somebody did it why don't we, you know john's done it long enough why don't we see if they can separate the secretary's job from that from the hanging rock from the ring hanging right yeah yeah so so that happened and i also indicated that uh, i thought that there was time for a new secretary and i forget who became secretary after me but it was shortly after that i think i probably did one more year of secretary after i didn't have to worry about hanging rock yes and then i left the that part altogether 
And it wasn't long after that, when it might have even been while it was going on, I just said, I had seen some literature about a car club that had a midweek run, to which someone said, well, that's a good idea, why don't you do it? <laughs> that's exactly so, what they so, said, why don't you do it? So you volunteered for so, so, so I said, okay, I'll do it. And I did that for probably more than 10 years. And how did you, you know, I, I never, the, I, the only one I went to was at the Lindsay Fox Museum. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Right? That's all we had. With, with you. Yeah. And, but I, I'm fully aware that you... you can, can you recall anything about the Lindsay Fox one? Because what happened there was, we had X number of people signed up. That was huge. And then a whole lot of people showed up on the day because they you know, worked in the city or something. Well, that was one of me. Okay. That was me, right? And I remember <laughs> the lady who was an organizer for Hindley, Lindsay Fox coming up to me and saying, John, I don't think you know how to count. <laughs> because I had said to her that we would have about 20. Yeah. And there was something like 58 people. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, she said, I don't think you know how to count. And, that was she and I said, sorry, I, I didn't know this was going to happen. And, uh, it didn't cause too oh, much no, of a no, problem, no, no, really, no. did it? But it was, no, it didn't. But it, it was a lot more people than I had told her. Yeah. I told her to plan yeah. on 20. <laughs> Which is how many people indicated they were interested. So how did you come up with these locations to go to? Uh, there are probably all locations that I, th well, to be very honest, I thought I'd be interested in them, so somebody else should be, but I mean, yeah. basically were issues. I mean, when you look back at some of the things we did, we also had a, twice we, we ran a week, we ran a three-day one. We did that twice. Did you? We went to uh, Lake Boga, you yeah, know, well, to see yes. the uh, flying boat. Yes. We did that one year and we camped, we stayed in Bort on the way at the caravan park. Yep. And then someplace else, I forget where else, and then came home again. So we did that twice and people were interested in that. And the club, not me, but the club used to also run an annual tour every year. Gene and I went to several of them. Yes. Uh, where we would go for a whole week. A whole week. Yeah, we went for well, a whole week. I've got on one of the other videos I've done, yeah. uh, was a trip to Canberra. Yes. And I, I can vividly remember in one of the pieces of the video, uh, your Black Riley. Yeah. With, I'm sure it had JV. Yeah, G. JVG, 55. Yeah. 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 So... Uh, and there's other pieces in that video yeah. where uh, every, everyone's enjoying themselves. So that was quite a long tour. Wasn't yeah, now those used to be organized by some, in other words, somebody organized that every, those tours every year. It wasn't me. Uh -huh. I was involved in it. Oh, man, this is high yeah. tea. It is. <laughs> yeah. These are warm, so that's the butter. Yes. And it's homemade, except for these little guys. Yeah, yeah. we got somebody brought those and to do us. You, do you expect me to eat all this by myself? No. One of each might help. Yeah. Now, I, I've just noticed an accent. Jim was born in California. I was born in uh, Holland. Yeah. But you, I lived in California. You were born in Holland? Yes. And my parents moved to California when I was 12. They immigrated yep. after Immigrated. Before. To California. And so late 40s or... 52. 52, you went yep. to California. Yep. And but, but I thought you went to Canada too. No, never been... To, I mean, been to Canada a trip, but never lived in Canada. Okay. No, not Canadian. Right. So, no, all the other things. So you met up somewhere in California? In high, school. high school. In high school? We went to the same school. We the in same school. about the 19... Or early 60s. We were married in 58. <laughs> Okay. We were married 65 years this year. Wow, congratulations. Yeah. Wow, there you go. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it, how you keep your accent? Yeah, well, <laughs> if you study languages, they say that if you pick up a new language before you're 12 years of age, you have a reasonable chance of, of losing your original lang uh, accent. 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 But if you do it after 12, your accent probably stays with you, but it modifies to some degree. My parents went to California when I was 12. Yeah. Uh, before that, we lived in Holland uh, and on, a, on a small, on an island off the coast of Holland, actually. I was born, physically born in a bomb shelter underground. Were you? Yeah, underground. Well, that, yeah. that's very convenient yeah. of your mother. <laughs> that's right. Well, on the island we lived on, I think there probably might have been a doctor there somewhere, but I wouldn't know where they were. And you basically lived on your own. You know, there wasn't much uh, mm. there. And the, and the place was occupied by the Germans. Did you get better? Yes, I, did I think they did. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yep. the, the island had a German anti-aircraft base on the island, which was in walking distance to where we lived. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I can remember as a child, that was quite exciting to see all these soldiers walking up and down the road, seeing trucks and tanks and all that. I mean, it meant very little to kids. Yes. Uh, other than but, the fact that obviously the parents thought about differently about it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, 12, you went to California. Yeah. And you would have been in high oh, school? Well, no. At 12... Believe it or not, they put me back in first grade. 
first grade. Yep, and I because I couldn't ah. speak a word of English. Okay. So I was in I was in first grade for a year. Mm -hmm. Then I did second and third grade in one year, fourth and fifth grade in one year, sixth and seventh in one year, right? So that's about four years. Yeah, eight by itself. And by that time, I caught up with everybody's age group. Because, uh, again, you, yeah. You, yeah. you would have picked up the English language. Oh, right, very early when I was in school. Yes. Yeah. yeah great. My parents didn't, but we did. Yes. Kids did. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how did you get from California to Australia? Headhunters. Yes. Okay, well, uh, there's also in the commercial field headhunters who look for people for, uh, to do certain jobs and so, so forth. So uh, you would have been, what, uh, early 20s now? Yes, I, no, I got, here with, I, I got here at age 34. Okay. Okay, I was yep. in university doing my master's degree. Yes. I saw an ad about some guy recruiter on so or looking for people for, Cal for Australia. Yeah. I met this guy on campus. Uh, he gave me a couple of ideas and he said to me, look, he said, would you be interested in coming to Australia? And I said, I oh, wouldn't mind for a, you know, for a tour or something. A short holiday. Short holiday, <laughs> yeah. So he said, fine. Uh, and then I didn't hear from him for a while. And then all of a sudden I got this letter mm -hmm. saying uh, they would like me to come for a year. And be doing, doing what? Being second in charge of the Moundsbury Youth Training Center. Now, I was so studying psych. I had already so been working. You've in, the, in prison, and I've been working in a youth institution. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was a criminologist working in two different places already. So, so you would have had some... Now, where is it? I've got something here in my pocket. <laughs> now... Not my business card, maybe. <laughs> now, yeah. I'm just going to read out your rap sheet. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah. I'll start at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay? Illicit drugs... Yep. Crime prevention and sentencing. Yeah. Criminal justice. Yeah. Victimology. Yep. Delinquency. Yeah. Those are all areas I've lectured in or or been involved in. Crime, criminology, yep. corrections. Yeah. Which is the main one. How many years did you do for all that? <laughs> between between the time you started reading and now. Yeah. Like, was, I still do a bit of consulting work off and on. What? So, sentencing. Appointed to the prison system in California before he was 21, well, when, and they had yeah. to wait. Yeah, when I went when I went to work in California as a base grade prison officer yes. at the age of 21, every person on the grounds, prisoners and staff, were all older than me on day one. Didn't wow. last long. Wow. So that was, and they had to wait till he was 21 to be officially hired. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you, you must. They must have highly thought well, highly of you. Either that or they have shorter staff. So 20, <laughs> 21, yeah. um, and give or take, I reckon you're a little bit on the high side of 60. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's say that's 40 odd years. I'm 84. You've spent, you've spent a long time. 50 plus years. Behind bars. <laughs> In different aspects. Have you ever slept inside? Yes. You have? Well, <laughs> when I first came to Australia, I worked at the Melsbury. I was, sec I, was, I was hired, supposedly, to be the deputy superintendent of the Melsbury Youth Training Center, when it was still reasonable and small and all that, because it's been a problem ever since. Uh, and anyway, about a month after I was there, they said, look, you're now in charge because the superintendent's leaving. So you... So I became the, in charge of the place. Oh. And then within three months of that, yep. someone said, without saying it, what we really brought you out here for is to be in charge of Pentridge. But we didn't know who you were and we didn't know much about you, so we thought we'd give you a... Give you a, a cushy job at yeah, Malmesbury. Yeah, so, so <laughs> then I went to Pentridge. So... And I was in charge of Pentridge. For how long? For from 80... Let me see, make the right, get the right name here. 87 to 88, uh, anyway, for about four years. And then I went to work as a, <clears throat> I went to work as a uh, professional advisor to the Attorney General for a politician. For Victoria? The, Victorian for? Attorney General. Okay. And I became what they call special advisor in corrections and criminal, criminology and criminal okay. justice. 
And I worked for a guy named Jim Kinnon, who at yeah. that time was the... On the on now of Jim Kinnon. Lovely yeah. man. Well, died of cancer. But anyway, I knew Jim. I definitely wasn't uh, into the into the uh, Labor Party at all, but he was. Yeah. But I can. Yeah, I had a lot of time for him, and he was so brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. How many staff reported to you at Pentridge? Uh, oh, at Pentridge. <laughs> uh, well, we had probably four hundred staff at Pentridge, and of course, thank you. And, uh, and then, do I call them residents or inmates or prisoners? Oh, prisoners, or? No, prisoners. There, we had a thousand prisoners at Pentridge. A thousand. Yeah. Uh, a thousand nine hundred and sixty or something rather, and and then uh, I was in charge there, and then the staff we probably had about four fifty staff. Remember now you got to have covered the place twenty four hours a day every day of the week. Correct. And you and you know you have to hire you have to hire two point one person to cover a job, you know twenty four hours a day all year round. Uh, so that you had a lot of staff. Then I had only I worked at the Law Reform Commission for a year or two. Yes. Uh, and which is a think tank. All right, and while I was working at the law reform, so I went from the criminal justice from from the uh, attorney general's office to the law reform commission. Yes. And while I was at the law reform commission, I was approached by the then uh, opposition member in charge of correct opposition's corrections minister that if I would come and take charge of the whole system, if they got into office. Well, there you go. Which they did. No, of course. So I was. Well, was, all, yeah. all this is yeah. happening actually happening. Yeah. You were the secretary of the car club. Yes. Mm -hmm. Most of the time I had the secretary of the car club, yeah. So how did you fit it all in? With great difficulty. <laughs> now, first is the oldest car, restored cars I have. I didn't know you had a little Well, I just got it back the other day. It's, 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 it's been given to my daughter. It's Lovely. going to board. And what year is this one? That's a 1969. Uh, 69 Worsley. Now, you'll, you'll have to forgive me because I don't know much Wolfley about... Worsley 1500, well, they're, uh, they're basic. Well, see what, you, what you see is what you get. Yeah. Uh, hard to believe that I spent just spent eight grand on getting it back to this shape without any touching in the paintwork. I mean, really? new tires, uh, new exhaust system. I didn't want Jerry to have it until it was it's basically right. ready to ride. Uh, so yeah. they, they're a beautiful little car, uh, one and a half liter. Yeah, you said uh, what, 1500. Yeah, no, so 1500 me. with, is it open? Yep, oh yeah, it's open. Yeah, that's uh, 1500. Uh, yeah. So it's a, uh, uh, I've had, this is, I bought this, oh, this is an interesting story, be, you can later on. Yep. I bought this probably in 1982, 83. Did you? I saw it on the street in Kyneton, parked in a, in a lot. Yes. Uh, not in a lot, in Guy's house. Yep. Uh, I stopped and said for sale. Uh, it wasn't like this. It wasn't. I had to respray it. But anyway, I saw it for sale. And that's all that years ago. And I said to, uh, and I stopped at the guy, and I said, uh, "Why is it? You know, what? Got talking to him. Why is it for sale?" Oh, he said, "I just cleaned it all up and fixed it all up for my daughter's wedding." But he said she didn't like it. So on the rebound, he sold it. He later told me he wished he hadn't. <laughs> so what's the fascination with the English cars? They're just. I just like, well, I guess what I had a Riley, of course. I, my Riley's yeah. been sold. My the, Riley the, the sold. The black one. Uh, oh. Well, real dark green. Dark green, okay. Uh, uh, Riley Pathfinder. I had a Borgward, so I got, had German cars as well. Borgward's yes. been sold. That's a lovely uh, My children car. said to me, uh, at your age, Dad, you better start getting rid of these cars. <laughs> <laughs> so the Borgward <laughs> sold. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, Riley sold. This has been given to my daughter. And you're left with? I've still what, got that. What's it, this? That's the RT 1800. The Austin 1800. Now, to, uh, yeah, this is, this is, this is, this is a... Uh, Oh, you, this is the one that's got the hydroelastic. You know, this, you'll have to tell me about the hydroelastic yeah, because yeah. I, I don't know much about hydroelastic yeah, suspension. Well, yeah, well, we'll take all this off and you so, can see the car is. Pull, pull it back. Just pull it yeah, back? Pull, all the way back. You might well, take it off if you're going to photograph it. Nobody, no, no, no. You don't even would, take, okay. That, that'll do. So. All right. Open far enough you can open the front doors. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then I'll open the bonnet. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, those displacers, I'll, get, I'll drag one out, but if you look over there on that bench on that side, way down there under by that side, seahorse, oh, that's, right, yes. you can drag any of them out. Man, look at them all. They're, they're, I know, they're two hey? sizes. Did I ever tell you how I got them? Have you cornered the market? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. You know, <laughs> uh, there's look, an English magazine now this advertising that they want to pay, pay 100 pounds for, for them. 
Now, this is a story. You need to tell me about these. Yeah, okay. Well, now there's two sizes. You see a smaller one down there, maybe? I see a uh, The smaller one is for the back. The bigger one is for the, uh, for the front. Because the front's much heavier, see? Yes. So, basically, we'll stand. So, this is a... I didn't expect... This, this goes to what? Uh, in, into, the, into the system whereby it goes back and forth to all the sides. So if this hose is the same diameter from the front to the back? No, no, no. There's a pipe. There's, there, there's a, what do you a, call a... A metal... Uh, yeah, metal... Uh, pipe? Uh, piping, yeah, piping. Uh, uh, you know, yes. brass piping. And I didn't, I didn't yeah. know. So yeah. this is all metal. Yeah, it's all metal and you, it can't be repaired. They cannot... If that bladder in there goes, which they do do, yes. you can't repair them. If the hose goes, fair enough. Yes. And that's why people keep looking for them, because they don't make them anymore. And people have now, there's now a shop in the UK, particularly a couple of them, yes. that would convert these to springs because you can't get these anymore. I've had this car. I've had that car for probably 30, no, 25 years. And I've done two. I've, I've, done, I've had two go bad on me. Okay. One was the front and one was the back. So were they easy to get out? They're not hard to get out, but you can't repair them. When you corner this car, Yes. It shifts weight from one side to the other. The car stays flat. The car will not lean. Okay. And that's, that's why they use them a lot for uh, rallying. Yeah. Because they successful. would. Okay. Yes. And then if front and back, it also, if the front pressure, pressure changes because you're going over a bump. It goes. It goes to the back and vice versa. Yes. So you know? it's a compensation system between that's the right. front and rear. Yeah. Yeah. Front and rear and side to side. Wow. Left to right. Yep. Now, but there's a spot right here. I can't even think what it is. Where you can pump it up. Oh. Pump, is it? So you put air in? No, no, it's uh, it's a fluid. It, it's got a fluid. What sort of fluid? Well, it, it used to be called. Uh, this used to be a little thing on here. Rides on fluid. Uh, used to say on here, but it's off. But it, what it is, it there was a special fluid that they made for them. Yes. Called hydroelastic fluid that they made for them. But now what they use is it's half uh, uh, glycol, glycol, and half methylated spirits. Is it? You mix them together. Wow. And then you pressure. You have a pressure pump. Uh, and I first looked the other day, I couldn't find it. The pump that we have now is actually ma made out of one of these. It, it, it's a pump that someone's made out of an old master cylinder. Yes. Uh, and it's got a handle on it. You, 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 you put the liquid in. You can change the pressure based on whether you want a real hard ride or a soft ride. Can you? Yeah. So once you get it to where you like it, then you leave it there. But you might, depending on what you're doing, sometimes when they're on rallies, apparently they used to change them much tighter so that they would, you know, wouldn't get such a hard ride. So the, the filler unit that... Yep, pump it up. Has it got a pressure gauge on it? It's got a pressure gauge on it. Well, you can all, they also make them out of a grease gun. Just uh -huh. use, the, just use the, the barrel of the grease gun yes. for the fluid. Yes. Now, the, the thing on the, on the, that you plug on, is quite a, it's the same idea as, a, as a, a one on a tire, except it's much bigger. Okay. It's bigger around. You plug it on there, and you pump it till you... Get the right pressure. Now that doesn't have a gauge, so you just have to know roughly where you want to be. And if it's too tight, you let some out. And if it's too uh, soft, you can put some more in. So, how much fluid would the system actually uh, hold? The system, the system uses about um, altogether. The system uses about two liters. I actually, had the car parked one place, and it let go. And and Did and <laughs> I, I walked away from the car. I was Jim was with me, and we walked away from the car. And I had this incredible bang, like someone shot a shotgun. And my car went on the ground like that. Did it? Now, what's the... They're an incredible vehicle because uh, what, they... What's the origins of this? What, what is... Okay, Austrian army. Aust built, yeah. But Austria. Yeah. Uh, built during the... And the, Aust and the uh, Australian army imported about 500 of them in 1970... 71, 2... So the, the Australian uh, they, army brought yeah, them in, in. They early. brought them in, and they found out that while they were very useful, they couldn't put enough weight in the back. There's enough space, and the weight the weight carrying is half a ton, but there's not enough space. They said for half a ton. <laughs> That's true. You know they like more space. The motor back here, by the way. So yeah. what size engine is it? Uh, it's uh, 695 cc's. Man, that's <laughs> tiny. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's two. It's uh, twin opposed, like a Volkswagen motor. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it's a. Uh, yep. It's a, uh, and I had this wonderful conversation when I finally went to insure it, and 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 um, so, so, for, the, so, for the insurance company, the guy telling me, 
uh, after I sent it to him that he wanted to know where the motor was. I had photographed it, like they said. Yes. And he called me back. Of course, he did, he's a young guy. He said, I haven't seen a motor. He said, I've got to see the motor. <laughs> so I had photographed it from here and here, and he still wanted to see the motor. <laughs> the fuel tank. I'll so that down. If you lit that seat up, yeah. I figured, I figured the reason that, I figured the reason they put the, uh, put the, the reason they put that cap so big is that you, if you've got to pour it in while you're driving, you can't miss. <laughs> Look yeah. at the size of it. Look at the size of the lid. That's huge. Yeah, that's right. That's almost like a truck size. I know. But yeah. Now, yeah. Got an extra can. That's a, what, 10 that's gallons? A, <laughs> 10 that, gallons? That's a, that's a normal. Jerry can. Jerry can. Uh, yeah. the, the, the main tank holds 12 gallons. Uh, yeah, that's want, a jerry can. So what that's sort the, of, that's the battery. What sort of uh, kilometers do you get per gallon uh, or liter? No I wouldn't. Idea. I wouldn't even know. But I think the book that I read one time said they do about 40, 40, uh, uh, 40 miles to the gallon. Okay. I don't know if it does or not. Uh, you wouldn't want to get this on the freeway, John. Well, I've had it on the freeway. Doing seventy. Doing seventy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, when you and if you look inside here, you can lock all the three. You lock all the diffs together, oh. and they are absolutely unstoppable. This, the, the, the story of people that have written about them, yes. say it will not, if you push it against it, drive it against a tree, it will not push the tree stop. down. It will climb the tree, really? and it will climb the tree. Wow. You cannot stop this thing. This is a breather for the motor. At the front? <laughs> it goes through. So the, there's a pipe all the way to- Yeah, see it? Sorry. I figured, that, I figured no air gets to the back. Is I, that I figured the it's most, take? Yeah, that's the area take. I figure that's the most inefficient. But anyway, look, look, there, there goes the pipe. That look, goes all the way to the back. All the back. <laughs> to the How? breather. And so that means, that means that the depth that you can go to in water is, is, about is that there, yeah. And the engine could be underwater. <laughs> yeah, could be. And, 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 and this, is the, this is the air conditioning. You open a little thing and it opens the air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's, on the internet, if you look up Halflinger on the internet, there's a few videos there yes. of them climbing things like you never think you've climbed over boulders and wow. in, in the trenches. Because I, my my finishing time was quite unpredictable from time to time based on well, yeah, you know I mean you know, well things being, would come uh, up. It's a, a quite a respons responsible role. Mm. So yes, uh, there would be certain times mm. when you couldn't get away. We had staff problems sometimes. You couldn't get away when you wanted to. Did you ever face a situation where? <laughs> One of the inmates got out. Uh, Pentridge, during my time, I think we probably had three escapes, all from people who were uh, minimum security working on either at or near the south gate or something or other, and then sneak so out. So it was an opportunity. Yeah, we never we never had anyone uh, jump, the wall, jump over the wall. The wall. <laughs> Although a fascinating story, which is in my book, I met a guy at a service station, must have been in Holland, maybe Germany, anyway. I met this guy and uh, I was wearing a, an Australian, some kind of Australian t-shirt that you could see that was Australia. And he walked up to me and he said, are you from Australia? I said, yeah, he said, where? I'll never forget this. I said, Victoria, he said, oh yeah. He said, uh, I was in prison there. He didn't know it was, some bar so. Yes. He said, I escaped. <laughs> Tell me that. <laughs> and he gave me the year. So, Ed, like, but no. what, were you still the superintendent? Yeah, I was. Yeah. So he didn't say anything. <laughs> he said, I escaped in 1958. Ah, all right. And I thought to myself, well, this guy's having me on. <laughs> he gave me his name. So, first name, if I remember right. So you went and did some quick when research? When I went back to Pentridge, <laughs> a couple, well, whenever I got back to the place I was, I got back to Pentridge. And I said to Jim Armstrong, who was my deputy, and Jim was a walking historian. I said, Jim, this guy claims that he escaped from D Division Pentridge in this particular year. And Jim said, sure did, never was found. <laughs> Fancy that. <laughs> and he, he, all these years later. That's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we, well, wouldn't, we wouldn't bother to, I suspect we wouldn't bother to pick him up even if no, we knew. No, it was too, too much uh, like hard Although, work. although there, there are some incredible stories around about people who escaped like that. The one that I'll never forget was in the Los Angeles Times when we were living here, and I read the story. I just couldn't believe it. I know it found that it was completely <laughs> true. This, this guy obviously was in his my, my, my 70s or 80s and had a bit of a drinking problem and, and lived with his daughter in Los Angeles someplace, and apparently his daughter kept saying to him, if you ever come home drunk again, call the police. I'm getting sick and tired of you getting drunk. 
And apparently one day he did, so she called the police, and they picked him up, and they put him into what they call the drunk tank, just kept him overnight. Yep. And as he's going, this is all in the, I got the, I got the article somewhere. As he's driving along, he keeps telling the policeman, he said, well, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. He said, I'm an escapee, and he was going on and on. And they said, look, old man, tomorrow morning when you wake up, <laughs> And you're sober, you can tell the sergeant, we don't want to hear it. <laughs> so the next morning, he said to the sergeant, when they were eating, they released him. He said, they told me to tell you the story. So he said, well, I escaped from this prison in, in uh, Nevada. And they said, oh, yeah? And they said, uh, well, tell us how all this happened. So he gave him the dates and the story and all that. Yes. Uh, he, was, he, he was a driver. He, he knew how to drive. And that was pretty unusual that back was in the 20s, yeah. 30s. Yep. And apparently uh, the superintendent, or whoever was in charge, the governor, needed the driver. So he used him to take him to town at night. <laughs> and one day he said, and the driver would give him, the, the superintendent would give him a dollar to go have a drink and spend his time and then drive him back. And he said, one day I decided not to go back. <laughs> so he said, I ditched the car. And, and, so, and then when they checked, the, sure enough, he had escaped. And then he said, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. He said, I killed somebody. Oh. And they already got the thing. And they said, where? He said, in Texas. I'm going to cut the whole story. He said, they said in Texas. They said, what, what's the guy's name? You know the name? And he said, where it happened? He told him where it happened. And I said, oh, this can't be true. Unsolved murder. Wow. He beat somebody to death with a shovel. They said, yeah. well, explain to us why, uh, after you did that, we found his wallet with money in it. He said, look, he owed me money. I took what, it, what he owed me. I did take the rest. <laughs> He's sort of honest. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, this guy had killed somebody, escaped from prison, and in his old age, he wants to tell people what he did. <laughs> Confessing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but anyway, this guy told me. Uh, and Jim Armstrong said, yeah. He, he yeah. jumped over the wall at South, South Wall at Pentridge, and I've never seen since. Wow. He ended up in Germany. <laughs> Now, that, that's interesting because you're... And Jeff, like Gene said, I used to play cricket with Jeff almost every night. So you're a Dutchman with American origins now in Australia playing cricket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jeff said the basketball, big way. <laughs> right. But he used to always... He, I think, uh, to be very honest, Jeff is just into sports in a big yes. way. And cricket is obviously something you could play out in the backyard much quicker than anything else. So therefore, we used to go play cricket yes. for about maybe an hour after yes. I got back, depending on the time of the day. Now, within the car club, the car club invites guest speakers in from yep. time to time. Mm -hmm. Now, we were fortunate to listen to one of uh, your little talks a week or so ago about youth crime. Mm -hmm. And um, so as an introduction, I've, I've, I've actually videoed yep. John um, talking at the car club. And uh, I'll, I'll put it up um, just after yep. John would like to possibly introduce the talk that he presented to the car club members. What do you reckon, John? Well, if I reduced it all to his easy title, it is all behavior is learned, mm -hmm. including criminal behavior, as well as non-criminal behavior. Behavior is learned. So those people who commit crimes, and particularly young kids, uh, they've obviously learned that somewhere. And they learned it and then once you learn something, you have to have a value system that permits you to do that. Mm -hmm. So you may learn that you get away with stealing something, but your own value system and your conscience says, no, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So therefore, values are learned as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, my favorite has to be something like uh, Junior comes home with a note from his teacher, which says, uh, your son's been, to the parents, your son's been lying at school. We would like to have you come to school, and we want to talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. Now, when Junior's at home, the telephone rings, and his mother says, tell him I'm not home. Now, Junior has learned that sometimes it's okay to lie. It's certain behavior. And it's behavior. Correct. And if you get enough of that, you basically say, well, sometimes it's okay, based on, therefore, you've learned that. Yes. And yep. uh, like I say, if you don't learn to do something well, you'll become a failure. And if you don't learn to, let's say you want to go into being a thief, if you get, keep getting caught, that means you didn't learn your trade very well. <laughs> the whole issue here is behavior and how do you behave and why do you behave the way you do. That includes me and you. Behavior, whether we like it or not, is learned. You learned everything you know. And it's very hard to unlearn a lot of things. And the kids that are on the street have learned behavior as well. Their values, 
their standards that they live by, have all been learned. They've been learned somewhere. Now, some of you may have watched TV or do watch TV about, I think, two weeks ago now. You might remember a, a young guy in the States who took a gun to school and killed three of his classmates. Since that time, this, this makes it made history, since that time, both his mother and his father have been charged, and both of them are in jail. Now, that's the first time that's happened. The parents have been held responsible for juniors. Now, in this case, he had a gun. I think his father bought it. His mother taught him, took him to the shooting range and all that. But the issue is uh, the values that that young fellow had caused him to do what he did. And he had learned those behaviors, and he had learned to do these things. And he had learned them, as we call it, sociologists, he had learned them by early socialization, which is when you're at home. We now spend a lot of time looking at kids who commit crimes, and we say, why do they do it? One of the things we don't do enough, and we need to do it, is say, why don't we look at the kids who don't commit crimes and find out how they're different? Now, you're about to release a book. Mm. And, um, and we're still arguing, not arguing, still, we're still discussing with the best title. And, uh, Prisons, the good, the bad, the sad. Yes. That's one possibility. Yep. And the other one is stone walls do not a prison make. I reckon the first one. Yeah, well, a lot of people think the first one because it's catchy. Yeah, now, it my editor has told me, if you want to find out what books sell and don't sell and what books are, are you know, she said, it's the title and the graphics. Yes. He said, if, a people, if someone doesn't pick up a book to look at it, then they go on yeah. to the next book. Yeah. I, but she said, you will pick up a book when you see the title because it catches you. It does. Or, 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 or the graphics. Yes. Or the person who's a known author. Yes. That will also do it. Correct. And she said, one of those three things causes people to pick up a book. So how did, how did you come up with that title uh, or working title? Just came up with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Stone Walls Do Not a Prison Make is actually the first half of a title of a poem that was written in the 1600s. It's really? called Stone Walls Do Not a Prison Make, Nor Iron Bars a Cage. Uh -huh. And it was written by a politician in the 1600s who was locked up in prison for some misdemeanor or something back in uh -huh. those days. Yes. And while he was in prison, he wrote this poem. Stone walls do not a prison make their iron bars a cage. Okay. Now that's no longer copyright or anything because it's all those time ago. Yes. So that poem still exists. Got and it. if I did use that title, I would definitely explain why I used it. Yes. Well, right. You'd probably have to include the poem, would you? I wouldn't include the poem or reference to the poem if not yes. the poem. Yeah. Yeah. But the other one was strictly my own. Okay. You know, yeah. Prison well, the good, the I bad, the it, bad, the sad. It, it's it's got a real sort of yeah. Ring. But you don't want the title to be too long. Correct. Because I would think. On the second one, where it says, stone walls do not a prison make, either on its own or a, by to, a, a byline underneath it, those that live there and work there do. Got it. In other words, yes. stone walls do not a prison make, those that work there and live there do. Now, that yeah. may or may not, I mean, I'm saying it, it stands yes. out by itself without that. Yeah. I've, I've circulated several names like that around well, and asked people to respond and say, which one would you... Now, that, now through this video, uh, it's for you? yes, yep. please, yes. Through this video, um, we welcome some feedback uh, and comments that, yep. uh, of what John has just uh, yep. mentioned. Yep. Uh, what what could be a, a good title? Um, <laughs> now, which of those two? <laughs> where, yeah, or something else? Yeah, or uh, something else. So, with your book, John, how how far away is your book? No. As with, I would say, whereabouts are we with your as book? Far, uh, the, the crowdfunding thing is, is ready now, but as far as way, the book itself, yes. I still probably have one more go through my personal self to yep. make a few little bits and pieces Adjustments. here and there, uh, and, 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 and probably a concluding paragraph or two. That's okay. it. So what I was saying, yep. at the, um, in the description field in the video, I can yep. actually put the details of where and how mm. to go about uh, getting access uh, to, yeah, well that, to the book. That, we, that, that I can't say at the moment yet because uh, while I'm working with an editor, mm. it, it ultimately ends up by the editor saying, yes, we will or, won't, we won't, we will, we will or we will not publish his book. Yeah, so what now, I don't have any doubts that they will, but I'm saying I couldn't say they will yeah. until they say they will. So what I can do is when that information <laughs> becomes available, yes. I can actually add it into the description field yes. yep. of the video. That'd be great. 
I'll, I'll put as much information as yep. I can in yep. the description field. Yeah. And um, I believe you're going to have your own YouTube channel shortly. Yeah, I have to have a. I have to have, I've got to get a YouTube channel. So, yep. uh, as another way, we're not sure what that might be called yet. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks very much, no. John. You're welcome. Thanks very you're much welcome. for that. You're welcome.